Happy President's Day, everyone. Welcome to the craziest installment of Nerd Central yet. We have action-packed packs. Haha, <laughs> see what I did there with the packed packs? Very funny. A wild edition of the best takes slightly off, and we might even have a special guest dropping by. Ooh, fancy. But for some reason, people just refuse to be civil to each other these days, and that will be our first subject when we kick it to the news. A war is brewing between two fandoms, and it's honestly just a bit petty and weird. Birds of Prey and Sonic fans have begun war, for some reason. In an attempt to sabotage Sonic's opening, some Birds of Prey fans took to Twitter before the movie even released, saying things such as, My kids and I walked out of Sonic. My kids had a much better time at Birds of Prey. Or, here's a good one, Sonic the Hedgehog has so many disgusting, homophobic, and racist moments, go see Birds of Prey instead. One, these are suggesting that children go to an R-rated movie rather than a PG children's movie. And two, we have confirmation that there are zero homophobic or racist moments in Sonic. Shocker, we're about to talk about Robert Pattinson as Batman again, as if we haven't talked about that enough last season, but now we have our first look at the new suit. Granted, not all of it, but it doesn't look bad. Theories are already popping up with some people thinking that the new bat symbol is made out of the gun that killed Batman's parents. We still have yet to see how long the ears will be, but the whole thing looks promising. Of course, the best part of this is it looks similar to Daredevil's costume, so now Daredevil is trending on Twitter. Let's take it to Kyber Fight with Kyle and learn about some great choreography. Welcome to episode 2 of Kyber Fight. I'm your host Kyle, and I will take you through the prequels and originals to examine my favorite aspects of Star Wars, the lightsaber duels. I'm not going to be doing the sequels anymore for... reasons. But without further ado, let's take a look at Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi versus Darth Maul. Star Wars The Phantom Menace. I swear, Liam Neeson in any role can make a movie better, and that trend stays with Star Wars. You can make the argument that Liam made this movie more tolerable to watch, which is fair because Jar Jar almost single-handedly ruined this movie, and if you think Jar Jar isn't that bad, you probably like the sequels too. After telling Padme and the guards to leave, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan come into contact with the Sith assassin Darth Maul. Maul draws a double-bladed lightsaber, my personal favorite design, and engages the Jedi. Maul with Maul, able to fend off both Jedi with relative ease. I mean, he is younger, more acrobatic, so, so that may have something to do with it. Maul uses the force to throw debris against the door panel, opening the door and allowing him to back up. A well-placed kick knocks Obi-Wan to the ground, forcing Qui-Gon to continue the fight. Qui-Gon's fighting style uses mostly defensive strikes or very wide strikes, which explains why even for his age, he's able to keep up with Maul. The three fight onto walkways above an abyss, where Maul kicks Obi-Wan off the edge. Okay, seriously, is Obi-Wan going to do anything in this fight besides getting kicked? Let's move on. As Obi-Wan hangs over the edge, Qui-Gon and Maul continue their fight towards a hallway on the far side of the room. Obi-Wan finally jumps back up and retrieves his lightsaber and stands there and watches his master fight Maul. I don't understand why he doesn't just get back into the fight. Ah, ah, I get it. <laughs> We're trying to create suspense. Uh, that's a good one. Obi-Wan jumps back onto the walkway and sprints towards the fight, attempting to catch up. Qui-Gon and Maul are separated by shields that divide the hallway into sections. Wait, hold up, hold up. Why? Why do you need six shields to protect the hall? N F it. Forget it. The shields open back up and the fight is on, except for Obi-Wan. He is caught in the shields again, and Qui-Gon has to fight Maul alone. Qui-Gon is visibly tired by this point and slows down his attacks. Maul gives him a hardcore boop with his hill before stabbing him in the gut. Obi-Wan says... <laughs> And it's at this moment you can see just how close Obi-Wan came to falling to the dark side. The shields open up again, and Obi-Wan is back into fighting. They seem evenly matched with both combatants being able to block and parry their, each other's attacks. Obi-Wan knocks Maul off balance and slices upwards, cutting his lightsaber in half. Maul uses his acrobatic abilities and flips around Obi-Wan. He manages to knock Obi-Wan's lightsaber away and force pushes him over the edge of the reactor shaft. Obi-Wan grabs onto a small ledge and hangs a few feet just below Maul. And Maul is so full of himself that he doesn't realize Obi-Wan force pulled Qui-Gon's lightsaber to his hand and cut the Sith Assassin in half. This is one of the better lightsaber duels we have seen in the Star Wars franchise and arguably the prequels have better fights when compared to the originals and the other ones. Still salty about last episode. Oh, such 
Thanks, Disney. For the, from the choreography of the fight to the musical score by the Lord himself, John Williams, this is a high-ranking fight on my list. I just love how we get to see the darker side of Obi-Wan just after Qui-Gon was struck down by Darth Maul. That look in his eyes tells you just how much he hates Maul, but he never lets it consume him. However, we will see the side of Obi-Wan in a future episode where anger does get the best of him. And this leads to more unfortunate circumstances, but hey, it's Star Wars, you already know what's going to happen. My point is, I'll give this fight four Baby Yodas out of five, just because everybody likes this fight, and I don't know why, but we just do. We'll leave it at that, okay? Thank you for tuning into this episode of Kyber Fight. Next episode, I'll go over the alleged most popular fight, Luke Skywalker vs. Darth Vader from Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. As always, this has been your host Kyle Wood, and may the Force be with you, always. Back to the news. Sony is really still trying this whole Spider-Man universe without Spider-Man thing, aren't they? A slate for an unannounced Sony Spider-Man project has been revealed for 2021. Fans speculate that this may be Silver and Black, a kind of buddy cop movie between Silver, Sable, and Black Cat that Sony has been trying to make for a while, but we will have to wait until the official announcement to find out. The Rogue One prequel that nobody asked for begins filming this year as Disney Plus attempts to make more money by having a solo Cassian Andor film. I hope it's good, but they all know that we're really waiting for that sweet, sweet Kenobi. Let's find out some cultural info with Wesley and Blackspiration, and then we will marvel at Kaylin with Marvelous. What's up, suckers, and welcome to another episode of Black Exploration. I'm your host, Wesley Ellington, and this is a show where we deep dive into all of your favorite black movies and TV shows. We talk about the culture impact, and we also talk about the quality of the show or movie. So without further ado, welcome to... All right, so before we get deep into this, I just want to apologize about the quality of the footage I'm going to be showing you guys. It's not the best because the show is about 25 years old, so it's pretty hard to find a lot of footage on this also because, as you'll learn later in the video, this is kind of like a hidden jewel of television, and it's not on many streaming sites. It's just on Hulu, and it's pretty difficult to find anything really on it. But the description of the show, according to Wikipedia, is about six black 20-somethings, four men, and two women sharing their lives and loves in a Brooklyn brownstone. A trio of women share one of the apartments receiving frequent visits from a fourth pal. Meanwhile, two men who've been friends for years share an apartment one floor up. Now the talent jump that we're going from from the first week to this week is pretty big. We've got a pretty stellar cast for the time period. We have Queen Latifah who you've known from years of movie and music playing the main character of Khadijah James. There's also the tenured actor of T.C. Carson playing the character of Kyle Barker. Now you may not recognize him when you see his face but you may recognize his voice. The gods of Olympus have abandoned. Yeah, he's Kratos. So those are the two biggest people that you may recognize now. But moving on to the rest of the cast of the main cast, that is John Hinton plays the character of Orton Obi Wakefield. You also have Kim Fields, who has been in like a bunch of Hallmark movies recently. That's not really the highest budget of films, but she plays the character of Regina Hunter. I'm going to be sticking with the main cast because there was some cast changes that happened later in the series run, but I'm just sticking with the original cast. And another character is Maxine. She is my personal favorite character, and she's played by Erica Alexander, who was, you probably definitely don't remember her, but I recognize her as soon as I saw her in the movie Get Out. She was the non-believing uh, officer that Lil Rail's character came to to, you know, pr report the whole kidnapping right we're gonna get into that probably later but right now we're gonna focus on living single now unlike dolomite last week living single was consistently rated amongst the highest shows on television during its run the biggest problem with the show was that it didn't really cross over into white audiences to me that's not really a problem i mean the show had amazing writing phenomenal acting and it always told meaningful stories to just pigeonhole the show as a black show or just a show that was for black people is incredibly disrespectful to all the creators and all the actors time that they put into it. The show was amazing for what it was 
it was a great sitcom that told stories that relate to people black or white now judging a show is a little bit different from judging a film mostly because the cinematography is far more complex in films but within a television show it's especially a sitcom it's much more 1a to it's very simple is what i'm getting to there wasn't really a big flaw with the show the only thing that i kind of didn't like about the show was how when kyle left tc carson uh, he decided to leave the show when he left they decided to replace him with another person not the exact same character but a character and in my opinion i never think that's a good idea but other than that the show was really amazing and personally one of my favorite of all time now here's where it gets kind of weird if if this show sounds a little familiar it's because it is yeah <laughs> yeah friends is white living single now sadly i don't have the time to explain the entire story and all of its gritty nasty details but i can't explain the comparison between the characters so of course the goofy charismatic character that we know and love joey is basically just overton the witty funny one is Maxine and also Chandler. The rich bougie one, that's Regine, that's also Rachel. You have your hippie, that's Phoebe, that's Sinclair. You also have your serious character who's Monica, that is Khadija. And that smart aleck know-it-all character that's Ross, <laughs> that's Kyle. Now since I haven't said it before, that's really the true impact behind this show. It led to friends now me i'm a huge friends fan i love the show now there's a lot of dirty laundry between living single and friends that i can't get into just simply because i don't have enough time but that's not what i want you to take away from this video what i want you to take away from this video is that this show had such an impact on the culture we rarely see successful black people in their mid-20s and that was something that was really inspirational we're kind of getting incredibly close on time but i promise we'll get into this later but until then i hope you dug it and this has been Hello and welcome to the second episode of Marvelous. I'm your host, Kaylin Byland. Here on Marvelous, we talk about the iconic weapons used in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, with the reason being that it's better than DC. Anyone who defends DC must be absolutely crazy. Today we're talking about Steve Rogers' Captain America. This iconic death frisbee is probably one of the most well-known weapons of all time. In 2011's Captain America, The First Avenger, Steve Rogers went through Project Rebirth, which turned him into a super soldier during World War II. At this time, we see the first heater-shaped shield. Given to him by the government, Steve served as their personal dancing monkey and dressed up in a star-spangled outfit to sell war bonds. The star-spangled man with a plan also used this shield to infiltrate a Hydra base. After Captain America saved over 400 soldiers from the secret Nazi base, Howard Stark decided to aid Captain America and gave him the circular shield we all know. The shield was actually developed by Howard and is made of vibranium, which is three times stronger than steel, a third of the weight of steel, is bulletproof, heat resistant, completely vibration absorbent, and is practically indestructible. This design allows Rogers to throw the shield like a discus. Not only that, but if it is thrown at the right angle, the shield can come back to Captain America like a boomerang. After defeating the Axis powers and Hydra, Steve became a capsicle for 70 years, but was reunited with his shield to continue his service with the Avengers, fighting alongside them for four years. Steve Rogers then lost his trademark shield in Captain America's Civil War when he fought Iron Man, who demanded his father's shield back. Two years later in Avengers Infinity War, as Thanos' army is approaching Wakanda, T'Challa gives Steve a modern version of the shield. Like Wakanda's technology, the shield is made of vibranium, and he uses it to strike and stab opponents with a pointed end. In Avengers Endgame, five years later after the Battle of Wakanda, Tony Stark returns the shield to Steve to use against Thanos. Thanos ended up totally destroying that shield in the final battle, but it's okay because the Avengers won. However, when Captain America traveled to the past to return all of the Infinity Stones, 
he decided to stay with Peggy Carter. Then, in the present, old Steve Rogers retrieved an intact shield and passed the shield and the mantle of Captain America to Sam Wilson. Now that we looked into the history of this iconic shield, let's take a look at that shield in action. All right, we're gonna take at this iconic shield. Now, visually speaking, I think the shield does a fantastic job of replicating the look from the original shield in the movie. It has a 24 inch diameter with the star, the red and white stripes, and it actually uses leather straps in the back. In terms of material, I'm assuming this shield isn't actually made of vibranium, but how cool would that be? It's actually made of the finest vibranium substitute known to modern man, plastic. But it does come with a gorgeous paint job. Looking at it in terms of use, Captain America uses this shield as a primary defense and offensive piece of equipment for battle, so it needs to be strong, accurate, and be able to fight off all of the bad guys. And to be quite honest, I don't think this shield is meant to be actually thrown or fight people with it, even though I totally would. Another thing I'm also wondering is, how exactly would you throw it? I mean, if your arms are in these straps, then it'd be pretty hard to yeet this sucker at a Nazi, you know? When it comes to using this thing, it should probably be used to show off in a display or just to pose in. That concludes our second episode of the season. I hope you had a marvelous time, and be sure to tune in next time where we'll discuss your favorite things from Marvel. I'm Kaylin Byland. That someone is trying to start a civil war within Nerd Central. We'll see how Cody responds to these callouts next week. Speaking of Cody, that's all for me, but stick around after the break for the best takes slightly off. All right, boys. Nothing but the open road. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Room. 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 What, room. what is this? <laughs> beep beep. <laughs> What's up? We're the best take, and uh, with Call of the Wild coming out, mm. why would you go watch an old man hang out with a giant CGI dog when you can watch four middle-aged men with their hogs, right? Because yeah. we watched Wild Hogs. Woo! A classic of Tim Allen and John Travolta's category with a little Martin Lawrence and not Steve Buscemi thrown in there for good measure. Yeah, it's the other guy. What was his name again, Will? The guy from Shameless. The guy from Shameless. What? The guy from Shameless. That character from Shameless. William H. Macy? Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah, one, he's, of he's one, one of the hogs. He's one of the hogs. He's in the movie. He gets a girlfriend in that movie. He does, yeah. doesn't he? Yeah. yeah Martin Lawrence is He's like the only one who ends up better than he was at the end of that movie. I don't know, Ray Liotta's character learns a powerful lesson from his dad, uh, Peter Fonda, <laughs> also known as Blade. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, it was um, some movie that I grew up kind of liking, you know, I always like my Lord's always like uh, John Travolta, so watching this movie, I think it was a Disney movie, wasn't it? Or, no. no. There's another Disney movie. That's like, uh, that's Old Dogs. Old Dogs, okay, I was, that's why I was, yeah, okay. So, this might even be PG-13, is it? it I believe be, so. I think it's PG-13. Yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah, this movie, um, we watched it a lot growing up, so it was always something that we kind of stuck around and watched, but it was nothing that we like remembered. For sure. Being hilarious. But no, it, I mean, it has a pretty stellar cast, so that kind of gave it a little long-lasting ability. Yeah, it's one of those that are like, always on TV. Yeah. But sometimes you watch it and sometimes you don't just because of the frequency of how much it's been on TV. Sure. Mm. Sure. Yeah. I'll I'll take the rose. Yeah. The thing is like I just have never heard of this. <laughs> it's a microphone. Yeah. Um I I've never heard of this movie before really? this week. Like I I had no idea that there was a movie out there with Martin Lawrence, William H Macy, uh John. Ray Liotta, John Travolta. <laughs> yeah. Just to put like who who put together this movie, man? It's just like it's. I don't know. I just don't think that a a very big predominant cast um, makes a good film. And like I think I've said that like many times. The only uh, thing that I think is like mildly interesting about this movie is that the diner that they built, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's like still there, you know, like a whole production crew had to erect it. 
and then it's just sitting in like a small town in New Mexico. And so someday, if, I, if I'm going through that state, I'm going to go to that restaurant. I'm going to say, <laughs> hey, knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm surprised. I, I've only heard people have positive memories of this film. I did no. not expect William to go, <laughs> no. go, go wild. Go wild hog. Go wild hog on the wild hogs. <laughs> <Please> stop. <laughs> I would say that, yeah, I, I would agree with you that, like, fundamentally, a cast doesn't guarantee a good movie. Thanks. For sure, for but sure. But what is great about this movie is that those are all, I mean, kind of sad people who have all at least had a low point in their career. Mm -hmm. And this is it for a lot of them. This is, like, almost as low as they got. <laughs> um, and it's not kind to them. So it is kind of fun to watch, like, William H. Macy drive his motorcycle into a street sign and like bonk his noggin and fall off. <laughs> I just think uh, it's really interesting how the cast sort of reflected on what was going on, on in their careers at the time. I know like growing up, Martin Lawrence was just like basically doing nothing because right after the Martin thing, he had like a heat stroke because he was like running outside. You guys know about this? No. no. Oh, no. I summed sum it up like a joke. But anyway, uh, he was like <laughs> running outside and he had like a bunch of like jackets on and coats and he had like a heat stroke and people were like, what's wrong with you? He's like, I'm doing cocaine. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so he eventually recovered from that and then this movie was, was made, of course. Uh, no, yeah, I don't know. It's just the, the William H. Macy and Ray Liotta and um, not Martin Lawrence actually like two like super like dramatic actors who have had some awesome success in the 90s suddenly come into this 2000s movie just unprepared unwilling and undiminished by <laughs> the amount of you know and I, I maybe Martin Lawrence is a reputable comedian I've never watched Martin or that whatever his show was I'm sure it's great um, I just don't think it works, and I just, I think it's very sad. Oh. Oh. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we should probably should have started with this, but uh, Wild Hogs is about a group of four middle-aged men yes. who are all tired of their wives and stuff and go on a road trip together. Some of them told their wives, some of them didn't. Like, obviously a lot of this is very 2000s-ish. Like, you don't need to know when the movie was made. You can guess based yeah. off the first five minutes. But it's almost kind of charming at this point, aside from that super homophobic stereotype. Yeah. yeah. And it ends in like a, it ends in a giant bar fight to save the city that they have just hung out in for a couple of days seeking refuge from their I'll admit, long trip it's of wild hockey. cool. <laughs> I think the, 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 the final scene of this movie is great, and I think the, like the bar fight was like fun to watch and stuff. But again, I just it's like the other ninety minutes or so of that movie where it's undeniably just oh my gosh, let's get through with it. Let's put this back in the DVD box and <laughs> put this away. Well, okay, I, I do want to explain the ending, and this might be a little spoiler heavy, but it's it's, wild it's, hogs. it's a movie yeah. from 2007. John Travolta blows up this like biker bar slash barn yeah. that belongs to this gang, kind of led by Ray Liotta. Um, and at the end, there's this big fight where these four wild hogs have to go against this entire biker gang. But just before it happens, Peter Fonda, who famously played the lead in Easy Rider, like the only famous motorcycle movie, he rolls up and is like, hey, you forgot about what it means to ride. Instead of fighting these tough guys who are way cooler than you, my son, Ray Liotta, <laughs> all of you need to get back on your motorcycles and just cruise the highway until you remember what this passion is all about. And you just can't find a better ending than that, right? They're all like, you know what, he's right. And they all get on their motorcycles and ride it's off. It's stupid. It's a bad ending. I think the, the final, the fight scene's cool, but that part was not what I meant. So, <laughs> just saying. Alright. Well, uh, apparently we're divided on wild hogs. I am, I am shocked. I can't wait to see <laughs> what Harrison Ford does in this wild spinoff with a weird CGI dog. Alright. Kyle? Wild hogs or the call of the wild? Uh, wild hogs for sure. Will? Yeah. It's gonna be call of the wild 95% of the way. The only 5% is because Ray Liotta is a, still a good actor in my opinion. Now, thanks to Chantix. Thanks to Chantix. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm stuck. Because I really like seeing Harrison Ford with like a, a furry companion. Furry. No, not a furry companion. <laughs> a hairy 
a companion, you know. But yeah. like a Wookiee, like a Wookiee, like a Wookiee. For instance, Chewbacca. No, uh, but no, I think uh, I think I I go with, I go with wild hogs. All right. I'm going wild hogs all the way. That dog looks <laughs> awful. Like, have you seen it? Yeah, it looks really It's good. like five feet tall. It's a real dog, boys. It like, got me. The government doesn't want you to know that that's a real dog. <laughs> real dog. <laughs> well, that's been it for uh, the call of the wild hogs. We are the best take on KZLX Tuesday nights at 7, if you don't want to see our stunning faces. Ha! <laughs> it's pretty rough. So you might as well listen to the radio show. Yeah, I don't know what that thing he just said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nerdmageddon is up next, and we'll see you guys next week on an all-new Nerd Central. Vroom, vroom. Vroom, vroom! <laughs> <laughs>